Um, John Glenham here again. Um, the latest installment in the video series is why you still can't find your Irish ancestors or why you can't find your Irish ancestors, the sequel. This could turn into a franchise. Okay, let's get stuck in. Okay, I'm going to talk about two specific um, mistakes that people make or flaws in the records they're using. Um, the first is, is a, a, a mistake that is more common now than it used to be um, to do with parishes. And the, the second is something that people might not realize about the records they're using. So to start off with the parishes, um, one of the most basic distinctions that you need to make um, in doing research on Irish records is the distinction between Catholic parishes and civil parishes. Okay, the Catholic parishes are the geographical areas, um, geographical units of the, the Catholic Church. This is something, again, um, it used to be that everybody in Ireland knew exactly the name of their parish that isn't the case anymore. And of course, it's also true the descendants of the Irish um, parishes can seem like very strange beasts. It's simply the geographical unit that was administered, usually in the case of the Catholic parish, from a, a large market town. Now, <clears throat> so if you see, you find something in a parish record and you want to go off and look at the state records, um, church, uh, Griffith's valuation or tithe books or um, estate records, and you say, oh, well, I know the parish. No, you don't. OK, this is the big mistake that people make. The Catholic parishes really only came into existence in about uh, the, the late 18th, early 19th century, and they kept changing in sizes. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. These are the, the Catholic parish maps. Um, so we we'll pick Roscommon because it's a wonderful county. And you can see there there are. 25, maybe 30 parishes there. By the way, you can click on them and go through, and we'll do that in a second. But first of all, I want to compare that to the map of civil parishes for Roscommon. And you can see there are way more. There are how many? 60 of them, okay, as opposed to the 25 to 30 Catholic parishes. So what's going on here? OK, what's going on here is the same thing that's, that's ruled Irish history um, for almost 500 years. It's the aftermath of the Reformation. It's Catholics versus Protestants. What happened in the 1500s when Henry VIII decided he wanted a divorce and he wanted some priests who would do what he told them and set up uh, the Church of England, he also set up the Church of Ireland. And the Church of Ireland took possession of all the existing infrastructure of the, the church, um, the Catholic church, as it was beforehand. So it took over all the parishes. These were medieval parishes. They've been set up in the the, uh, the 12th century, I think, or thereabouts, the, the boundaries. And Henry and his successors made the Church of Ireland the state church of Ireland. So they, it was the official religion was Anglicanism. And because of that, Anglican parishes were used to administer the state. So they were used to collect taxes, uh, to measure land. They were used in um, defining estate records. They were used in anything um, anything the state had to administer. They were the, the, the uh, geographic divisions of choice. All right. What happened to the Catholic Church after the Anglican Church took over all its infrastructure? It withered and it was uh, persecuted and really only began to come back in the 18th century. Um, and when it did come back, it didn't use the old medieval parish infrastructure. It very sensibly um, developed new Catholic parish maps, so or new Catholic parishes rather. So for example, um, okay, you have, uh, let me see an example. Okay, Kilkeven is the Catholic parish of Castlereagh. 
in County Roscommon. Um, it's uh, it means Kevin's Church. Saint Kevin was the the the, the man in charge, um, and that's the 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 Catholic um, the Catholic listing. If you want to see what Church of Ireland um, civil parish, in this case, the civil parish and the Catholic parish are the same. Okay, let's try and pick one that isn't quite as um, as simple as that. Tr Strokestown. Strokestown and County Roscommon, listing of place names. And you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six separate civil parishes that are partly in Strokestown. So one of the features of the civil parish is that they're generally smaller. Um, they, the Catholic parish amalgamated. It, there had been a lot of changes in the three or 400 years since the, the, the Reformation. So the, the, the parish structure reflects it. It means that if you're trying to go from state records, so tithe books, Griffiths, uh, valuation office records, um, go from those to the Catholic parish, you have to translate from the civil parish to the Catholic parish, and the same the other way. If you have a record in a civil parish, okay, and it doesn't give an address, then the person you're talking about could be in any of these civil parishes. So you're going to have to search through all of those. And that confusion between civil parish and Catholic parish is, uh, it can be a serious obstacle to finding your way through the, the maze of Irish records. Um, if you want to go the other way, if you have a, a civil parish and you want to see what Catholic parish, okay, this should be, let's pick a nice small one here. Number 33 is Killinvoy. And on the, the civil parish, you get a, a link for church records. And once again, I've managed to pick one where the civil and the Catholic are identical. Let's see if we can go back and uh, um, pick something. Ockram, I think that's identical too. Okay, what, what's this one here? This one is Oran, okay? And Catholic Parish of Oran, okay? You see, one of the, the you can see how carefully planned the video is and how, how well scripted and planned in advance it is. Um, we'll try another one. St. Peter's Civil Parish, okay? Church records. So partly in St. Peter's in, in at Loan. So that's at Loan. Okay, you can see the, the principle anyway. The principle is that you, you are not dealing with the same beast in the civil parish and the Catholic parish, and you need to use both sets of records. So you need to be able to translate from one end to the other and back again. That's one of the things the site does as a matter of course. That's the one of the things the, um, the, the Catholic parish maps particularly allow you to go from the... Uh, from the, the Catholic parish to all of the, the places in the civil parish. The problem is that the civil parishes and Catholic parishes don't translate perfectly. There are places, um, the, the, the only 19th century guide to what uh, areas are included in Catholic parishes is this, is Lewis's Topographical Dictionary of 1837. And you can see at the bottom of each entry, um, it says, in the Orsi divisions, the parish is in the union or district of Abbey Leash. That's in this case. In lots of other cases, he'd say, in the Orsi divisions, this parish is partly in the, in the union of or the parish of Ballymore and partly in the parish of Ballybeg. But he doesn't say which parts. So there's a certain ambiguity that you're just going to have to live with about this. But just be aware, you have to translate from one to the other to make any sense to go from Catholic Church records to um, to state records, okay. <clears throat> that's the, the the sort of that that's that's Irish ancestors one hundred and one. Um, but sometimes um, because I've been doing it so long, I, I forget that other people find this kind of strange. Whereas to me, it's perfectly normal. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about is an obstacle that arises because of a peculiarity in the state records of births, marriages, and deaths. And um, there is a, okay, there's a blog post I wrote about it, um, which is there on the, again, the blog is freely available. Um, this is one of the things when, when I was 
starting off doing genealogy and going in and using the printed indexes of births, marriages and deaths, there were always a certain number of, particularly in the birth registrations, um, entries in the indexes that just said Murphy, male, no first name. And they always seem to be, there seem to be a lot of them in Dublin, Cork, Belfast, Limerick. When you're dealing, when you're, you're fishing through a keyhole the way I was or the way we all were using the printed indexes, you couldn't afford, you, you know, you just had to say, well, that's, uh, that's collateral damage. I'm afraid I can't, can't go through all the Murphys in Cork in the case one of them, in, the, in case one of them happens to be the person I'm looking for. When Irish genealogy came online and it was possible to go in and check each of them, it became clear why there were so many being registered without a first name. Um, this is, if we look at this, okay, this is a page from the Rotunda Maternity Hospital, Lying In Hospital, um, in North Dublin in 1864. And you can see it says, name if any. And there are no first names. Okay, there's full parents' names, John Knight and Mary Ann Torrington, uh, Brian Halden and Anne Coyle, and so on and so forth. And there's a, a very convenient um, little column over here on the right that says, baptismal name if added after registration of birth and date. So the parents could come back and add a baptismal name if they wanted. Um, and I think that this, this is the reason why the name was not obligatory, is that there was a certain sensitivity about infant baptism. It was a very common practice amongst Catholics and not so common amongst non-Catholics, um, amongst um, Anglicans and Presbyterians particularly. So, um, they, rather than get involved in, in forcing people to choose a name um, when the child was newborn, uh, they left it open. And they left it open and the maternity hospitals took it as a loophole, as an opportunity to register entire wards full of children without bothering to find out their first names. So it was a, an administrative loophole. It, it's happened most frequently for hospitals like this, the Rotunda, um, for Donegal Street, lying in hospital in Belfast, um, for hospitals in Cork and Limerick and, and Galway to some extent. It also happened with uh, midwives who, as part of the service uh, to after the child was born, said, well, I'll register it for you. And they just registered the child without the first name because it was easier. This is something that is, uh, because the, the records are all there and you can go through them, this now means there is an extra level of uncertainty. If you're not finding what you're expecting to find, the person you're expecting to find in the birth records particularly, and it's one of these urban areas, um, you may have to go in, search, you can search in irishgenealogy.ie uh, in the, the birth indexes. And what you have to do is search under unknown. You can see in the search box here, I just put in unknown. So that's where, where there is no first name registered. They have, uh, they've interpreted that in the transcriptions as unknown. So it is possible to search for all unnamed. Um, and this is a, a simple search that uh, just searches the entire records. And you can see there are nearly 200,000 birth records without a first name. And you can see, if you look at the, the the registration districts, um, urban areas are way disproportionately represented. So 41,000 in Dublin North, 19,000 in Dublin South, Belfast, um, 22,000 in Belfast, uh, so, so on and so forth. You get the idea. This means this is an extra, um, an extra string to your bow if you want to be optimistic about it, an extra chore if you don't. But you need to be aware that this was a common practice in all urban areas, and it may very well be the, the main reason why you're not finding your Irish ancestors. If you want to find out more about how the system worked and um, the, the comparison with um, uh, England and Scotland and Wales, where in Scotland, it was always compulsory to register a child. England and Wales, like Ireland, left this loophole, um, but it was used much less. So Ireland, again, um, is a bit of an outlier with this. Anyway, if you want to find out more, it's there on the blog 
and uh, you're welcome to, to email me about it if you want. Um, I hope you found this of some use. Um, I think this is a rich vein that I'm going to mine a lot more in the future. Anyway, thank you for, for listening or watching and uh, uh, happy hunting.